stardust. Think about it. Evidence suggests that life happened from cosmic processes. The iron in our bodies and the water in our bodies as well came from the stars. Therefore, every matter we know, of course, comes from the stars. So, I remember when I was 13 years old and I became interested in astronomy. And I saw the picture of Buzz Aldrin standing in front of the American flag on the moon, and I decided that I want to become an astronomer one day, just because I saw that picture. And I told myself that I'm going to find life in the universe one day. And today, I am an astronomer and soon an aerospace engineer, and I have the same goal as I had when I was 13 years old. Which takes me to the next uh, topic. What is life? We know the meaning of the word, but how are we going to define what it is? We know what is meant when we say that something is alive, but remember that you and I have different vision of, uh, visions of what life might be. In science, however, life can be anything. Everything from small microscopic bacteria to huge animals. It doesn't have to be intelligent or as intelligent as us. And remember that even if we find small fossils or remains of life somewhere else, that means that we are not alone in the universe and we are automatically insignificant. So think about it. So what does it take for life to exist somewhere? There are actually many factors that decide whether a planet can have life or not. For instance, why isn't Mercury or Pluto full of creatures like here on Earth? Well, one of the things is that our planet is on the habitable zone. And the habitable zone is a great position in the solar system because uh, it will uh, permit the planet or body to sustain an atmosphere and liquid water. So Earth is in that zone, Mercury is not, and Pluto is not. And this distance depends on the size of the star. So if the star is really big, of course the distance between them has to increase as well, obviously. So we are lucky enough to be in the habitable zone. Another important thing that astronomers have told us is that a planet or a solar system needs to have a huge planet. And why is that? Well, we can take Jupiter as an example. Jupiter works as, an, as a vacuum cleaner, basically. It attracts all big asteroids and other dangerous uh, bodies that might collide with us and destroy everything here. So these are the two things amongst some other uh, factors that decides whether or not we can have live a life on a planet. So I am really interested in one body, particularly this one, as you can see in the photo here. And this one is very special because as you can see, it has eyes on it. But there are other things that makes this one very special. It has liquid water, a global liquid ocean. It also has many active gases that are spraying out water to Saturn's, uh, uh, well, it's Saturn's uh, moon, by the way, Enceladus. It is spraying out water to its um, outer rings, and it's a really active body in the solar system. And it's more active than, for instance, Mars. I mean, why are we interested in Mars? <laughs> There's like a small percentage of liquid water on Mars, but why are we still investigating that planet when we have this one? I, have, I don't have an answer to that, actually. So this one might be a perfect place for life. Who knows? What if we find it one day? There. I want to do it, by the way. I hope so. <laughs> so, I'm really interested in this um, topic, to find life in the universe and the solar system. So, sometimes I like to design my own projects and space missions. 
and I had a chance to present two of them on the European Planetary Science Congress in France a couple of months ago, and I'm just going to tell you a little about it. First of all, it was my first poster session. I mean, I was so scared because all of the attendants were actual astronomers. They were basically experts in this, and I was afraid that they would criticize me for everything in detail. And they were actually kind, of course, <laughs> and we brainstormed a little, and I got some new ideas after that day. So what I learned so far is that a space mission or, yeah, is quite complicated. And they asked me, okay, this, they asked me, they were, do you, you want to find life on Enceladus. How are you going to do it? And I told them, well, I want to send an underwater robot to that moon. And they were like, why? Why, why Enceladus? Why are you going to do it? Well, I told them, imagine this. There is life on Enceladus beneath the ice surface. How would it feel if we actually had footage of this life swimming in the water? Wouldn't it be groundbreaking and paradigm shifting? I mean, it would change us completely. They were, of course, skeptical and told me, why not use the old method, send satellites through the geysers, and let the satellites collect the samples instead? Well, of course, they are always in the comf uh, this, these comfort zones, of course, astronomers. I understand them, but you have to try a little harder, I mean, <laughs> otherwise, how, how are we going to succeed? So after that day, I really I realized how much work and how much energy there, there is behind a space mission. You don't know, know a percentage of it, actually. We don't read a percentage of it in the newspapers. And I believe that we will someday find something, very soon, actually, 10, 20, 50 years. I mean, it sounds uh, like it's, <laughs> uh, it's many years, but in astronomical terms, it's nothing, basically. So, let us take um, a look at something different. That is, it's a silly question, but let us presume that we have this um, spacecraft, a lander, that is, on a planet, and it finds something one day. How do we know that that life is from the planet it is observing and not from Earth? Well, it's a huge problem, actually, and it seems like there always is a passenger that survives this. Even though we are building the spacecrafts in clean rooms and disinfects them, they seem to survive for some reason. And the astronomers have found life, evidence of life, about 16 kilometers above our surface, in the atmosphere, actually. And also one specific one, the target rate that I cannot pronounce, but I can show it to you. This one right here, you have maybe read about it. Imagine this one being in the waters of Enceladus. Why not? I mean, it will be possible for it. Since it's alien, it can survive in harsh environments. It can be exposed to radiation about 100 times necessary to kill us. And one-sixth of its DNA it's, is alien, basically. So there is a possibility, who knows? So now a little step further to advanced life. What stands in our way when it comes to finding something in the solar system or somewhere else? The two main reasons to why we haven't found anything is the distance between the bodies and the technology we are having today. Let us look at the distance. The closest star system to us, Alpha Centauri, is 4.3 light years away from us. Okay. It sounds a little, but it takes 4.3 years for the light to reach our eyes. So let us presume that we have a space shuttle and we are sitting in the space shuttle and traveling towards that system. It would take us more than 150,000 years to reach that system. So it's impossible for us, unfortunately. But what we will do in the future when we want to ex um, examine a body or observe a body will be to send a robot to that planet or uh, yeah, moon or whatever we are interested in. 
because a robot has the ability to travel in great distances without any problem, and it, if it's intelligent, it can fix itself, and so on. So, uh, what happens if we don't receive anything? Not a single signal from somewhere. Does it mean that we are alone? No, actually not. Well, this is my, uh, what I believe in, actually. Uh, the human factor is always there, of course. Maybe our measurements hasn't been sensitive enough. Maybe we have missed the signal from an alien life. Or maybe something different. We are contacting a planet that has life, but it's not evolved enough, and it cannot contact, contact us back. Of course, whatever it might be, we should, of course, continue with the search if we really want to find out if we are alone or not in the universe. So for now, we don't have the ability to send something, a robot, to a distant planet. So what we are doing right now is to use instruments instead. One example is the radio telescope. A radio telescope can send signals, radio signals, to a distant planet and hopefully uh, get an answer back. And these signals can travel in great distances and carry a lot of information. Another thing that we are using right now that is really great is the telescope. For now, we have found more than 1,000 exoplanets. That is planets outside our own solar system. And many of them have been Jupiter-sized. So this, does this mean that, that it's only Jupiter-sized planets outside our solar system? No, it's just much easier to find bigger planets and then smaller. But we have found about 20 so-called super-Earths. That is, planets that are almost as big as our own planet. And they can have life, we don't know. So before we learn how to travel through space and time, I don't know if it will happen, maybe it will. This is the only thing we can do right now. To hope for an answer back and to send signals to planets. I want you to take a look at this animation. This is Hubble's deep field image. And what you are seeing here are not stars, these are single galaxies. And each of them has some million or even billion stars. And since astronomy is nothing without numbers, I'm going to tell you a little about the numbers we know so far. So for now, we know that there is approximately between 200 to 400 billion stars in our own galaxies. And there is an equal number of galaxies in the universe. So what does it mean? It means that about yeah, 10 to the power of 22. So th these are the stars that we have in the... Yeah, it's a huge number, I can't even say it. But, <laughs> but it's a lot of... There are many stars, actually, and about one percentage of these can have an Earth-like uh, planet, which is not so much, basically. So to guess the total number of planets is in the Milky Way is easy for astronomers. It's about 160 billion planets, just in our own galaxy. So imagine to multiply, multiplying this with the amount of uh, galaxies there are in our universe. I mean, it's impossible, right? <laughs> My head hurts, of course. <laughs> So before I leave the stage, I just want to tell you something. I remember when I was uh, 14 years old and I saw the craters of the moon for the first time with my own telescope. And the things that I felt that day was just incredible. I was actually scared to look at the craters because they were so strange. I have never seen something like, like this before. And I want you all to go to an an observatory, or even buy your own telescope and just observe the night sky, because I will promise you that you will feel the same thing that I felt the first time 
when you see the rings of Saturn or the moons of Jupiter or even a galaxy. I will promise you that you will never forget that feeling because I have seen these more than hundreds of times and I, they still amaze me and that is maybe why I continue with astronomy. Thank you.